I want to start with what I was just discussing with uh, Sarah um, Constance and Brian, that it's the very first time in my life that I put a flag in my presentation and I use the sign of the flag. But the circumstances has been, have been you know, really difficult and uh, it also made it difficult for me to concentrate on this talk. And I also do not take for granted to, uh, that you showed up today for this seminar because I know that all our minds are with Ukraine at the moment. Anyway, thank you for the, to the organizers for inviting me and giving me a chance to speak on my research which develops at the intersection of social history biographical method and memory studies and relates to the memories of transformation in industry in Eastern Europe and specifically in Poland. In what follows, uh, I would like to bring together some aspects of the studies of neoliberalism, memory studies and post-socialist studies. Through examining how the economic transformation of the 1990s has been remembered in Poland, I want to address three interconnected issues. In the first place, uh, my talk will respond to the more and more frequently advocated postulate to bring economy into memory studies, a field largely dominated by matters related to wars and mass violence. To this end, I will comment on the different scales of memory, of the most profound change of the late 20th century, the institutionalization of neoliberalism as a hegemonic economic and political discourse by the impact of globalization, fiscal austerity measures, the industrialization, privatization processes has been a worldwide experience. They were particularly sudden and acute in the so-called transition economies of East Central Europe. I will comment on how this experience has been filtered, has, has been filtered reframed and largely repressed in political discourse, uh, Political, real, uh, political memory scale, as well as at various heritage uh, spaces in the cultural memory realm in Poland. Second, by focusing on the results of an oral history project of over 130 biographical interviews, I will try to point out on the challenges to the politics of memory and the culture of memory posed by vernacular memory of the witnesses of transformation. Diverse agents of industry sector, chief executive managers, trade union representatives, administrative staff, and shop floor workers. And third, by reflecting on the approach of this project that have connected university students who were interviewers and witnesses who were the interviewees in an attempt to give a voice to the biographical experience of transformation, I will ponder the question of public use and potential of such an approach against the background of political memories and institutionalized cultural heritage. I'm aware that these are quite complex issues and each of them could make for a separate talk. I will not exhaust them, but rather map them for a further discussion and exploration. I will go through some points in more detail and some in more bullet points. By bringing all of them together, I wanted to allude to what uh, Sarah uh, Gensburger and Sabrina Lafranc wrote in their recent book, Beyond Memory, Can We Really Learn From the Past? Sarah and Sandrine observed that those memory policies develop with a belief that commemorative initiatives can help us to build a better peaceful future, very often fail to do what they promise. Despite several decades of expensive memory culture, revolving around human rights, the memory policies haven't stopped new wars, terrorism, populism, and discrimination in contemporary societies. As far as I understand, uh, uh, this sobering skepticism has become one of the underlying themes of this seminar too, because we need to fight, face it as memory scholars. But there are also important questions beyond that skepticism uh, that this seminar asks. Can, can some narratives on the past and some memory practices be more successful than others or under what condition can they contribute to transforming society? In my talk, using the Polish example, I will add to both the skepticism and to those questions. I will argue that we need memory practices that go beyond political memory of events, but we still do not know how to make them effective. And this is what we should discuss further. And uh, okay, now I need to learn how to change the slides. Does it work? Okay, now it does. Yeah. Um, 
So my talk is divided into three parts, uh, neoliberal turn, memory politics and heritage space, neoliberal turn and biographical memories and beyond neoliberal practices. Uh, the starting point of my talk uh, is the more and more uh, often expressed dissatisfaction with the mainstream of memory studies as a field as it stands now. The bulk of international memory studies of the second and of the so-called second and third waves of memory studies have revolved around the themes of wars, violence, and diverse aspects of transitional justice seen either from national or transnational perspective. By no means there have been good reasons for this, the colonization, the decay of communism, the collapse of authoritarian regimes uh, were followed by the establishment of various institutions dealing with transitional justice for perpetrators and victims of past crimes. The Great War and the Second World War and the Holocaust in particular were revisited by next generation. More generally, the democratization of public life was coupled with a growing demand for the articulation of the memories of various groups long silenced historically including women, people of color, and impoverished classes who had their subaltern memories of key events that shaped the 20s and the beginnings of the 20th uh, century. However, less spectacular but equally important changes in social and economic foundation of society have been often underplayed in this view focusing on event type of memory. Of course, the idea that we should account for socioeconomic foundation of society is quite banal, for sociologists, anthropologists, or social historians interested in studying collective memory processes, and yet it has not been considered enough in the mainstream of the memory studies, which has been mainly shaped by the studies of the memory of events. In this framework, one of the themes that still marries the discussion are the links between memory studies and memory cultures and the neoliberal turn that produced one of the greatest socioeconomic changes since the 1970s. Of course, there is a large debate on what neoliberal, neoliberalism is, if it has existed at all, and if yes, with what, with what intensity in what regions of the world. I'm not going into the details of the economic debate and the definitions of liberalism. They have produced much argument among uh, economists with studies of the different schools of neoliberal thought and debates over how neoliberals define the role of the state. Instead, I follow a sociological approach approach that sees neoliberalism broadly and the quote as the project of economic and social transformation under the sign of the free market related uh, to the institutional arrangements to implement this project. The key category of neoliberalism is the free market, however, differently from the 19th century economic liberalism, it implies that there is a economic policy. Recently, Romanian political scientist Christian Chertel tried to critically analyze the links between the memory boom and the neoliberal turn. He sees a connection between the two uh, at two main levels, including both links between neoliberalism and the memory boom as historical processes, as well as between neoliberalism and scholarship and memory. On the one hand, the terminology of memory studies and the institutionalization of a neoliberal approach in political and economic policies and practices became widespread in the same time, starting from the end of the 1970s and the beginning of the 80s. They both shared the assumption of the end of history. Across Europe and beyond, memory projects, uh, public condemnations of the uh, violent past and various transitional justice processes and mechanisms revolve around the human right paradigm. On the other uh, hand, Christian Ch Churchill pays attention to the terminology of memory studies and memory cultures often employs corporate neoliberal thinking and jargon. As scholars of memory, we tend to use terms as management of the past, entrepreneurs of memory, memory markets, accountability of memory, or memory stakeholders. Also, memory discourses are often analyzed as being in a state of competitions with each other. The past frame as memory is marketized and consumed. Church's key argument is that both neoliberal turn and memory boom have in common narrowing of temporal political horizons characterized by the absence of the future-oriented politics. While I agree with most of his argument, 
I would like to rather stress the repressive nature of both neoliberal memory culture, as well as its Janus phase, the populist ethnocentric non-national memory culture. Being competitive with each other, they repress effective articulation of other regimes of memory. This is what I want to illustrate with the Polish example. The neoliberal term reshaped the world, but it reshaped, as I've already said, East Central Europe in a particular way. One of the most profound arguments about seeing East Central Europe as a laboratory of global neoliberal processes is compression in time and space of phenomena that have been gradual and diverse in other localities in 1970s, such as the shift from Fordism to post-Fordism, immense technological changes, connection with global capital, labor and commodity markets, the industrialization, the regularization, privatization of key infrastructures and services, and the introduction of corporate management and public management practices. All those processes condensed to several years in the 1990s were connected with attempts to build liberal political institutions. Indeed, Eastern Europe embraced most of the problems of late modernity in one decade, and to no big surprise, those experiences were followed by the shift away toward illiberalism or populism, if you will, fueled by the accumulated stress, disappointed expectations, and unfulfilled hopes of the 1990s. The large scholarship of post-socialist studies developing since 1990s points, uh, points out that the institution, institutional reforms significantly changed norms structuring social life, influenced people's choices, and shaped reactions and new rules in formal and informal uh, ways. The neoliberal policies unleashed radical social reorganization and social dislocation. Privatization processes of state-owned enterprises were followed by abrupt industrialization, then composition and symbolic devaluation of the working class. Austerity measures meant unemployment and deprivation of large groups of society. The growth of small and medium enterprises and the opening of domestic economies to international corporate investors unlocked new and diverse career opportunities. Reprivatization and restitution of property, property to former pre-socialist era to former pre-socialist era owners resulted in sometimes abrupt social transfer, catapulting individuals into new property class. Coupled with technological and post folded shift, neoliberal policies imply changes in organizational cultures as well as skills required on labor markets. The actual effects of this radical socioeconomic change were full of conflicts, tensions, and negotiations, and resulted in various hybrid, fuzzy socioeconomic forms with institutional solutions differing in various countries of the region. Countries also differed in the scale of oligarchization of business, informal economic corruption, and crime that accompanied the hasty implementation of, ref uh, of reforms. All of these contradictions and processes still defining our present, are hardly represented in the museum spaces across East Central Europe. So now let me really zoom to Poland uh, and comment a little bit how it has been shaped in terms of the politics of memory and the culture of memory uh, in quite a nutshell. On the one hand, the entire neoliberal setting of the 1990s injected into society a powerful dominant narrative that was not supportive of any positive memories of socialist industrialism, which collapsed in a few years in the 1990s. On the other hand, the post-1989 memory politics was dominated by political parties with the roots in the uh, solidarity social movements of the 1980s, which, uh, which was both a large working class movement as well as national movement and became a reservoir, reservoir of symbolism for the post-1989 politics. In the short-lived moments when the post-communist parties were in power, they adhered to neoliberal politics of memory in the renunciation of socialism, becoming mnemonic abnegators, to use the term, uh, term by Michael Bernhardt and Jan Kubik. The memory climate and policies have therefore largely been shaped by the liberal center and the conservative parties, and in the last decade by the populist law and justice. All of them could build their legitimacy and the symbolism of solidarity, albeit of, of its diverse interpretations. 
These two political camps have dominated the representation of socialism and transformation in the fields of political memory, public memory, and heritage. Despite many differences, they have one thing in common. They have largely either neglected or condemned any, as I already said, many positive memories of everyday life in socialist time because they rooted the legitimacy in the anti-communist opposition. However, they have clashed with each other over the idolized representations of solidarity as a social movement and interpretations of the political transformation. In the narrative, in the narrative of the liberal centers of democracy and the transformation of 1990s was another step along the Polish road to freedom alignment with Western democracies, uh, European Union and the NATO. According to the story of the political right, solidarity fought for national, traditional, and Catholic values, and the moment of transformation was hijacked by the conspiracy, the alleged conspiracy of the liberal elite with post-communism who betrayed solidarity, solidarity's ideas. Those memory politics had consequences for the heritage sector in Poland, which had been booming, especially since 2004, the accession to the EU. For instance, a narrative about the democratizing role of solidarity with the simplified image of political struggles under socialism and with no place for a profound discussion of the authorities and the stress of transformation has been particularly silent in the main museums related to the experience of socialist industrial workers. The European uh, Solidarity Center in Gdańsk, which is placed um, uh, and very much connected to the memory of the Gdańsk shipyard, the one which led Wałęsa started the, the Solidarity Movement, and the Silesian Museum in Katowice, they both were created by more liberal leaning uh, political leaders. The law and justice had criticized both museums ever since it came to power. However, the core of the ideological struggle was over the political representation of historical events and not the nuances of the industrial life. Overall, overall, the peculiarity of the country that had the largest industrial opposition to the socialist regime in the 1980s is that the battles over the political meaning of this opposition have overshadowed the memories of daily life and the demise of the very industrial community from which the opposition and its subsequent political parties derive their identity and legitimacy. Of course, these are the main trends and there have been heritage projects seeing the past in a more complex way, but they stay outside this hegemonic politics of memory and hegemonic culture of memory. And now let's move to the, to the second section. Uh, I would like to shift from the level of uh, memory politics and heritage sites to the level of individual uh, and vernacular memories. Between 2010 and 2016, I led a team of students and young researchers in recording uh, over 130 biographical narrative interviews with employees of 12 Polish socialist enterprises that were sold to multinationals in the mid-1990s. Our research related to a critical strand of literature and post-socialism in East Central Europe on the one hand, and on the other to a wider context of labor transformation under global capitalism and supplemented the earlier studies of transformation with its focus on how the processes of privatization and industrial reorganization were remembered by post-socialist employees after the decades that had passed since the shock therapy of the 1990s. In conducting the interviews, we ask for an uninterrupted life story, starting with a question, please tell me the story of your life, which we then follow up with questions relating to the interviews, like recollections of work and private life under socialism and capitalism, and to the evaluations of these two periods of their lives. We have also supplemented interviews with desk and archival research on the history of 12 industrial sites, which were of interest. Um, to us. So just briefly to show it with the slides, um, we were interested with in the in the um, flagship state owned uh, enterprises which were privatized before 1997 because that was the moment of the biggest privatization in the industry sector, which the privatization which was successful, but the factories were after after what were significantly downsides. Uh, uh, we looked for the different branches of industry from light to heavy, 
from for diverse foreign investors because we're also interested if, if it's a culture of the foreign investors which might bring a change to the way the um, the transformation is carried on underground and different regions of Poland so that's more or less the, how, how the different factories look at the map and that's a list of the factories which probably doesn't tell any, a lot to anyone who outside of Poland but you can see the also the list of the international companies which bought the, uh, uh, the multinationals which actually bought those uh, places. So there was a factory, so there was a chocolate factory, there was a steel work, there was a boat producer, there was a beer brew brewery, there was a cement factory, cigarette producer, tires producers, instant food producer, um, paper producer, uh, car producer, uh, uh, medical equipment producer, and uh, detergent producing producers. And there was there were different, uh, depending on the uh, on, on how we were at the access point to the factories, we were able to record more interviews in some of them and less um, in the others. I, I won't go more into the details of that, but I can answer some questions how we actually did the interviews and how did how we did that. Uh, just to this slide shows you how. Um, how it looks in terms of the um, uh, of the gender and of age. So among the, the, uh, the, the narrators diverse in terms of gender, class, and political views were former, uh, you know, different people from like different strata of companies. But what is really important is that most of them, as you can see from this slide, were born after the Second World War. And they began their professional careers in the 1960s, 60s, um, and the 1970s. And it's really important that they spent the most of their professional uh, lives in a single factory. The spaces of experience and the horizons of expectations were shaped by the modernization of Polish industry in the 1970s, based on Western technologies and loans, uh, by the 1980-81 anti-systemic revolt of the solidarity, uh, and by the country's economic depression in the 1980s. They were in their prime when they entered a period of transformation which radically changed their workplace. And most of them remained employed until their reti retirement while others changed jobs or some went on to collect pre-retirement allowances. So the, that was, the sample was diverse in, in, those, uh, in those terms. And in effect of this project, we produce a rich material uh, which that can be used for different purposes and analyzed in diverse ways with different research and practical questions in mind. In mind, so there, there is an oral history audio collection uh, which uh, has audio recording, transcripts, and also the collection of um, photos. Uh, there is a documentary book for the general readership where we have uh, juxtaposed with my colleague 27 stories out of the out of the out of that bigger sample uh, where we try to find we, we focused on four factories and from each of the factories we found you know stories of the people who tell us the same stories in a diverse uh, in a diverse ways and of course there are also academic um, articles so I will just go very briefly through some some of the findings. So of course that kind of memory, you know, which you evoked with that kind of method tells us a lot about how, uh, how it is generational. It tells a lot about the everyday life experience and everyday life narratives. And it's, it gives this bottom up access to meanings of values and the emotions of transformation. And the very basic differences with that intensive politics of history at the party, party politics levels and the interviews is such that, as I, as I already said, there was, you know, there, there was this politics by the so-called mnemonic abnegators by Kubik and Benha, who say, more or less, let's forget about socialist past, let's concentrate on the future. Or there is this post-solidarity movement, mnemonic warriors, politics of national populism, who concentrates on condemning socialism. The, in this official politics of history, socialism is what's usually bad, ineffective, corrupted, and backward. Transformation was either good or bad, depending if this were the neoliberals or the mm, mm, populists. 
the, the official politics of history always concentrate on national frameworks of memory and the memory of events and on the differently understood nostalgia for solidarity in the interviews. So it's a very nuanced picture of socialism and transformation. So there is no one story of that. There are several intersecting frameworks of memory. There are national too, but there are local frameworks of the, you know, of the factory, of the uh, region, of the city, but also very much global frameworks of memory uh, when we deal with the branches of industry. So, you know, steel workers or uh, chocolate producers, you know, they have a different temporality uh, from each other, but also from the, uh, uh, from the, uh, the national frames of memory. Uh, there are, there are, of course, memory of events, but that can be different memory of events. So that could, that could can be political events. They, some, they happen there too, but there are also uh, events which has the local importance as privatization of the, of the factory, for instance. But there is also, of course, a lot of the memory of the everyday. There are almost no abnegators to socialism. You just cannot condemn half of your professional life. But instead, there are different types of nostalgia of industrial life, which to put it in the boring terms, which I will not develop now, are either restorative or reflexive, but also mediated by the memories of waste, poverty, corrupted and compromised power structures uh, of socialist governance. So it's not that you know, all these interviews present kind of idealized vision of socialism. So they can be very reflective on, on how their life uh, went. And also, they're very reflective on, um, on transformation, but they have a different views on that. So from that uh, you know, rich material, we kind of try to also to concentrate on some main trends. And they are uh, kind of uh, represented in uh, that table. Uh, so we revealed two general and dominant modes of remembering the transition. And there was no alternative future-oriented approach and a moral economy past-oriented approach. Approach. Both of them, uh, both of them, you can see here, and the, uh, there was no alternative. There was no alternative mode. The Tina mode is a direct reflection of the neoliberal mainstream narrative of the 1990s. It is composed of ideas of rational economic calculation, neoliberal work ethic, and managerial technocracy. It emphasizes modernization, technological development, strong position on the global market, improvements of, in the organization, appearance and safety of a workplace, as well as the prosperity of future generation and the benefit of a local community and the country in general. One can see that neoliberalism, which became the basic narrative for planning an uncertain future, uh, also shaped the memories of some of our interviewees. By contrast, the other dominant mode of remembering the transition placed the decay of community values at its core, often drawing nostalgic examples from the socialist past and the decision to use moral economy to label various forms of dissatisfaction about downsizing and reorganization of post-socialist <laughs> factories follow those interpretation of E.P. Thompson original idea that stressed its significance for post-Soviet economies and the industrialization processes. In general, the concept denotes norms and values evoked during the processes of disembeddedness of social groups from their traditional institutional settings by market forces. In times of rapid transformation and social uprooting, communities tend to invoke the past consensus subsequently subsequent, uh, later unbroken because of technological and market forced changes. And uh, I know it's so difficult like, to hear in that very abstract language what is really there in that material in the interviews. And they were all conducted in Polish. So I will just share with you a few uh, you know, experts in English so you can feel the material which we have. Um, that's Constante from a Veda factory electrician. When a company moved in, uh, which is the company which privatized, uh, which was the, the key one, which, uh, you know, the key actor which privatized uh, in privatization of, of Veda, uh, they put us all into one shop, cut down the number of people, started economizing. They watch us and judge if we work effectively enough. 
They talked to managers and foremen, stood watchers right behind our backs. You had to keep improving. You had to compete to show you are better than others. You had to fight for survival to compete with your colleagues and friends. There were people with children still at school, so they had to fight for some children's survivals as well as their own. Some uh, had nervous breakdowns. And that's one of the narratives of someone who you know, explains that how it works, but actually which you cannot see from that uh, fragment, he's very happy about his own life because he said, I succeeded. You know? And then he says to the interviewer, look, you know, I'm, I'm retired right now, but you know, I can afford going to, uh, you know, going for the um, vacation somewhere to Thailand and so on. And it was worth it, right? But he still also reflects on those who did not succeed or, or for, for whom it was a more difficult thing. What I also want to uh, now juxtapose are the uh, fragments stories of two managers for, uh, from the paper factory. And it's interesting that they both had a quite a similar position in the, in the firm. So they were both, they both had a managerial position, but they both see the moment very differently. And that's, uh, uh, that's a woman, Magda, who says, when the firm got privatized and went public, our age group was stripped of a sense of dignity. We always said we were a lost generation for we had been denied an opportunity to learn foreign languages. I knew colleagues who were full of practical knowledge but could not share it over a language barrier. Then there appeared a group of very young people straight from college whose adventure over us was that they were able beautifully to say in English, how do you do? But her, his, her colleagues said something really opposite. I managed to learn English just in time. I had started rather late in 1990, but very intensively. In 1992, I was sent to Japan for two months within a state-owned enterprises management training program. In a group of 20 of various trades, we learned theory and practice of business management and so on. So there is this narrative of success and catching opportunity where, where, uh, when it was. And then they both observation of what was going on underground. Piotr says, during the first year, we offered special severance pay to those who would accept voluntary termination and agree to go. About two or 300 went like that. Then they started, then there's, then there started unavoidable collective layoffs. They were very well prepared. We hired rep reputable consul consultants of Hay Group, and they helped us prepare a detailed plan how to downsize as painlessly as possible with much more support to the laid off, psychological support when they were told they had to go, support in the process of retraining, and obviously the financial support, the severance pay was equal to one year's salary. I'm sure it was tough for them at the time, but perhaps from a distance, they found some justification and understanding that it was worth it for the benefit of their children or even grandchildren, that this was for future generation. I, I, I sincerely hope so. And this is Magda, who tells the story of exactly the same life ox. Later on, it got better, but the 1990s, that turn, it was really bad. On your way to work, you met women in tears. Tears and tears and tears. She's sobbing here, another is crying to her. Then your family member loses three jobs and you feel bad because you have a job. And what will you do? You are a member of a supervisory board? Won't you arrange something for your sister, for your cousin? I saw through despair. This women sucked on the spot, downsizing in Schwitzia where there were no longer any jobs for women. But the worst thing was that it came with no warning. You worked the night shift and then at dawn you were dismissed. I remember the tears in an inventory department. The women came to the office in the morning and were told to go back home on the spot. Next day they came to collect their possessions. So that was just, you know, an example of, of, of the rich material which we have, which really juxtaposed very different position and very different um, interpretation of uh, quite similar, uh, of the similar events. And now to move to the final points, uh, to the final point. The question of public use and potential of such an oral history approach against the background of political memories um, and institutionalized cultural heritage. 
And here I would like to uh, refer to the concept of agonistic memories introduced some time ago by Anna Chentopoul and Hans Christian Locke. I know I'm not particularly original in this uh, concept now circulates very broadly in memory studies, but I still think it has some unexplored potential to be further discussed among scholars who deal with oral histories and testimonies, especially with such conflicting accounts as those. As you might remember, Anna Chantabul and Hans Christian Locke hijacked the idea of Chantal Mouffe for the purpose of memory studies. After Mouffe, they criticized both the post-political vision, which informs neoliberal rationalism, as well as the belief in a cosmopolitan, partisan-free consensual order. The approach underlies the, re the relevance of collective identities um, and of the related conflicts in the configuration of the political understood as the uh, way society is instituted together with the passions and emotions such identities entail. The agonistic memory spaces should be able to provide legitimate political chan channels for dissenting counter hegemonic voices and for the articulation of opposing passions and affects. The opposing parties might not reach the consensus, consensus, but they might appreciate each other's position at the end. Against this background, the background, Christian Churchill, whom I quoted at the beginning of my talk, argues for a move from the politics of memory to the memory of politics. He stresses that the politics of memory is both pass-oriented and present, failing to promote the construction of a future in common. In exchange, the memory of politics could bring back to the foreground former futures, previous ideas of the collective struggles aiming to put them in practice. Stefan Berger and Stephen Hyde rephrased this argument in the context of the industrial milieu. By transferring the concept of agonies to the memory of the industrial past, they advocate for a mnemonic space that is reflexive, open to multi-perspectivity and counter-hegemonic. Quote, while allowing multiple voices of diverse agents with mutually exclusive agendas to be heard, agonistic memory would recognize the victims of this industrial past and the industrializing present and support the causes. At the same time, agonistic memories frames would bring this victim's perspective into dialogue with other perspectives. So by producing a political debate and the industrialization and opposing its understanding as an unchangeable natural force. This approach also seeks to understand the socio-political conditions of our increasingly post-industrial present by pointing to different possible futures arising from diverse representations of the past." End of the quote. On this point, Stefan Berger argued also elsewhere, elsewhere that in order for agonism to become a socially productive and collectively sh shared sentiment, it needs to be supported by the heritage sector. The sector must be capable of delivering practical pasts that are likely to empower communities, both to retain a sense of pride in the past and to adapt for the future. Berger juxtaposes examples of rural region, which to extent managed to do so, with the localities uh, in the US and UK where the heritage sector is not very conducive to balancing industrial sentiments with post these changes. In Poland, where the regime change and the industrialization took place simultaneously, collective memory processes were complicated even further and resulted in a discrepancy between the content of vernacular industrial memory and political memory, which to a large extent dictates how industrial socialism can or cannot be turned into heritage. And now really the final point. I'm quite convinced that the method with which we work, the biographical interviews help to articulate the agonistic perspective by the means of supporting intergenerational exchange uh, of perspectives and articulating the stories that have not as yet, uh, that have not as yet circulated in the public by co-creating co and curating multi-perspectivity of those stories by making them accessible by producing a collection of stories in wider circulation and by engaging with wider publics that allow for diverse readings of open-ended stories. And yet, uh, 
we are left with general open questions and general challenges and doubts, which can be asked to any other oral history project, not only the one which is related to the industrial, uh, to the industrial memories. How to strengthen the oral history role in the heritage space, both on site and digital, against the hegemonic memory patterns. How not to narrow down biographical accounts to mere illustrations in a museum space, which, as you know, happens very often, but to use them as a tool of genuine social dialogue. How to make oral history projects effective with modest financial aims. The oral history projects are very time and energy consuming and very expensive. <laughs> and at the same time, uh, it's always very difficult to convince you know, uh, funders to fund something which would uh, be solely based on oral history. And finally, how to make oral history project effective in an unfriendly political environment. Uh, we are going, I hope we are going to deal with some of these questions for several years now in the slow memory project that have been just kicked off by Jenny Bistenberg from the NTU UK, of which Sarah, uh, myself, and Stefan Berger and many other colleagues are members of. But still, I would be very happy to hear your reactions and very grateful, grateful for examples of good practices from which we can learn. Thank you so much.